I, I'm going to talk a little bit about genetics and um, particularly I'm going to have to touch on some of the highlights over the last couple of decades just very briefly, but you know, it's well accepted that modern humans originated in Africa and spread out from there, but what's really not well understood is the extent to which the ancestral population that gave rise to our species was isolated and to what extent uh, different archaic forms may have contributed to modern diversity. And I think answering these questions is going to be very important for understanding the origin of innovation, how these innovations may have been shared or how they were uniquely uh, um, adapted to one small area of Africa. So I was thinking a lot like Ajit when I was wanted to take one step back and show how humans fit into the larger picture of primate phylogeny. This is a tree, a phylogenetic tree based on the latest whole genome sequence data. And um, what you can see is that humans form this one branch most closely related to chimpanzees. And um, certainly we are great apes, but what I also wanted to point out, there's something a little bit unusual about humans, and that is if you notice the other great apes uh, have uh, subspecies or closely related forms that they, they coexist with. For example, orangutans, there's the Sumatran and Bornean orangutan. Gorillas, there's three or four different subspecies of gorillas, low uh, lowland, eastern and western lowland gorillas, uh, mountain gorillas, which aren't shown. And then, in, of course, in chimpanzees, we have bonobos and then four different subspecies of chimpanzees, and we stand alone here. And so the question is, um, wh where, how did we become the last standing representative of the genus Homo? And one possible answer is that, or why are we alone? One possible answer is that our success resulted in the demise of what might be considered subspecies, or I know Chris stays away from that word, just closely related uh, groups, genetically genetically differentiated but related morphologically groups. And uh, these could have been, as we know very well from the fossil record, uh, sharing, coexisting with us for a long time, but uh, have since disappeared. So let's, let's take a qu little bit closer look at the tip of that human or that a hominid branch. And as has already been pointed out, the fossil record is reconstructed and we can see the time at which presumably these different uh, forms existed. I've color-coded them to show that yellow is Eurasian forms, specifically, and dark blue is African forms. And uh, the ones that are found in both places are, are mixed colors. And you can notice, again, the couple of major points that Homo sapiens is a very young species appearing only in the last couple hundred thousand years, or, and that the fact that there's overlappingness in these bars suggests that they were coexisting for quite some time. So what happened to these other forms? And how did we become the last standing representative of, of the genus? Well, that brings us to the models, also covered by Chris nicely, and I do have Chris's picture up here, and uh, Milford Wolpoff, who's known, very well known for his putting forward the multi-regional evolution model, which I find to be a very interesting model from a population genetics point of view, where you have the gradual transition uh, from archaic to modern form over the full range of all these different uh, groups in Eurasia and Africa, and this uh, is seen to occur because they're connected. They're all connected through this sort of trellis-like pattern with these little blue arrows representing gene flow, which is the steady process of migration of individuals from one group to the other, interbreeding, and then a very critical component to this is that there's natural selection. So the traits that are favored are going to spread from one place to the next, and the other traits that are locally adapted will stay local. And so you'll have local differentiation as well as this idea that the, um, the beneficial traits that make us anatomically modern are eventually s assembled in one morphological package through this process. And so it's seen as, uh, you wouldn't even call these different species, we'd call them just different forms of, the gene, of one species under that view. Now, of course, the extreme alternative view um, is this recent out of Africa model or the complete replacement model, which suggests quite differently that all of the traits uh, that make us modern trace to one place, a single population in Africa. And whereas this model would predict that some of our genes would trace back to many of these different ancestors in the past, all of our genes would trace back to one local group in Africa. So those are predictions of the two models. Um, what kinds of genetic evidence has been produced in the past that made us so strongly go with the recent replacement model and kind of move away from the, uh, the multi-regional model? Well, going back to, uh, I would call it a landmark paper in 1987, 
led by um, Alan Wilson and Rebecca Kahn and Mark Stone King. This is, what I this is what is known as the indirect approach, and that is where you survey variation in natural populations, and then you make inferences about the past by looking at the, g the shape of the gene tree that you construct from the genetic variation. And in this particular case, the, in the 80s, they were looking at restriction fragment length polymorphism. They reconstructed a tree. I'm actually showing a tree from a paper in 2000 by Ulf Ullenston where they used whole mitochondrial genomes, but the, the result was the same. The, the reason that they, they came down on the side of a recent African origin was that you can see three different reasons. One is that the African lineages, which, which I've shown in red, are longer and they're more mutationally diverse, which suggests there's been more evolutionary time in Africa for these lineages to evolve. Also, the root of the tree is found among Africans, suggesting that the mitochondrial DNA traces back to a single point in Africa, a single woman at one point in the past that lived in a population in Africa. And the final point that's just as important is that the time for all of this evolutionary change leading back to the root of this tree was very recent, within the last 200,000 years, which is very much within the time frame of the period in which Homo sapiens originated. So I've shown the mitochondrial tree now against the reconstructed fossil record, and you can see that the, all the lineages of contemporary humans where you have Africans and on one side of the, the root and Asian Africans and others on the other side, all tracing back to a common ancestor within the last 200,000 years. There's no other lineages present in the modern pool that would represent perhaps what might be variation found in these other forms, these archaic forms. So this was a strong signal to coming, com coming from the genetic side that made such an impact in the way we think. It's quite interesting to think what if we had found a different tree or looked at a different region of the genome first? But this was the first. It made a large impact. Some of you are old enough to remember 1988 when it made the cover of Newsweek. Now, another nail in the coffin of multi-regional evolution came in, uh, 10 years later. Svante Pabo had also been working in uh, Alan Wilson's lab trying to figure out ways to recover ancient DNA from fossil material. And in 1997, Svante and his, his group were successful in isolating DNA from ne three Neanderthal bones. Um, they sequenced a small portion of the mitochondria, this is called the D loop, and they reconstructed a gene tree. And they found that the, the Neanderthals formed a clade or a group that was quite distinct from everything we knew that was segregating in modern humans, suggesting there was no mixing, no interbreeding. Again, supporting the idea of this complete replacement, at least with respect to Neanderthals. Now, move forward another 10 years, and certainly the technology had improved, and Svante's group um, continued to work on uh, this ancient DNA, in particular shown here, mitochondrial sequencing of the entire 6,500 nucleotides of the mitochondrial genome in five different Neanderthals, a more resolved uh, tree for modern humans. You can see, again, the same pattern, very distinct from variation in modern humans. A, you know, a, so uh, unequivocally establishing that the Neanderthal mitochondrial DNA falls outside variation in, in modern humans. Now, we take it forward on just one more year. So as recently, 2009, we were still talking about complete replacement with respect to mitochondrial DNA. The technology uh, in DNA sequencing has gotten to the point where it becomes more feasible to sequence whole genomes, and in particular genomes of extinct forms, and the complete genome sequences were obtained in draft form from Neanderthals as well as this mystery uh, form called Denisova from a, a molar and a finger bone. And I don't want to go into the details as I said, but the, the bottom line here is that uh, non-Africans and uh, a group from uh, Australasia or Oceania contain a small amount of their genome that comes, that directly matches the Neanderthal and the Denisova genome respectively. And in order to explain that uh, interesting pattern of sharing, um, it was suggested that there were two interbreeding events. One, as anatomically modern humans first got out of Africa into the Middle East, mixing with Neanderthals. A second uh, interbreeding event somewhere in Southeast Asia, just before anatomically modern humans made it into New Guinea and Australia some 40,000 years ago. And then a second migration from the Middle East to East Asia without, inter uh, without interbreeding with Denisova. Now, I, um, these draft genomes provided compelling evidence for interbreeding, but it was not the first evidence we had for, inter uh, for interbreeding. Going back to 2005, Dan Garrigan in my lab, a postdoc in my lab, um, uh, was leading a project to look at 
genetic variation and an interesting locus on the X chromosome. And when we uh, reconstructed the gene tree for this region on the X chromosome, we found a gene tree that was quite distinct in many ways from the mitochondrial gene tree. For example, there are two major clades. One clade is entirely restricted to Asians, and the other clade shows is in Asians and everyone else, including Africans. Most of, the, most of the loci we look at look just like this part of the clade, where there's an African outgroup and everybody else on the rest of the branches. But in this case, it was Asians as the outgroup. The root was in Asia, and the time to the root was about one and a half million years. So it's interesting to think if we had discovered this kind of uh, pattern before we discovered the mitochondrial pattern, how we might think differently about, about human origins from a genetic perspective. But in this case, nevertheless, we hypothesized that this pattern arose through a pat, uh, process of interbreeding as anatomically modern humans got into East Asia, perhaps mixing with Homo erectus, and uh, this little piece of the genome surviving in modern humans today. But interestingly, as many years later, as the Neanderthal draft genome came out, we compared the sequence of this divergent lineage to the, Neand to the Neanderthal genome, and it matched the Neanderthal genome. So we were correct in saying that there was integration of this divergent branch. But we were not correct in that it turns out it was likely Neanderthal that uh, was uh, the, uh, the, the uh, offered this, this branch into the genome of, of modern humans. Now, uh, I also have a grad student who is finishing up who has, in his graduate career, discovered a few more loci that looked very much like this, one which had an Oceanian outgroup and another one that looked something like this. He had uh, suggested to me <laughs> that this was, uh, these are other examples of interbreeding and intergression. And um, I said, well, you've got, you've got to do a lot to prove that. But meanwhile, the draft genomes came out. He was proven correct. In fact, one case it was Neanderthal admixture. In the other case, it was Denisa, Denisovan admixture. But um, using these kinds of examples where we could identify, based on certain characteristics of the DNA sequence, what was likely to have intergressed, we decided to pursue a pro an approach where we would do this in a computational way and screen larger regions of the genome looking for intergressed fragments. And the theory and, uh, behind this is simple in that if we have a model of uh, divergence where two groups diverge in the deep past, they stay separate into separate lineages, such as one leading to archaics, one leading to moderns, and there's a period, a short period of recent interbreeding where some of the DNA is now exchanged. Um, what, the, the, what the genetic pattern might look like in, in that kind of model is, for example, if we have these two bars representing chromosomes in modern humans and these in our, uh, our, an archaic form, in the first generation you have a hybrid where each chromosome, one coming from a modern parent, one coming from an archaic parent, are, form distinct full chromosomes. But in the process of recombination and many generations later, these orange chunks, these archaic chunks get broken down into smaller and smaller pieces. And so our plan was to look for these small little chunks of DNA by the signatures that were specific to the interbreeding process, which I don't have time to go into. But given that we didn't have a reference sequence for fossil DNA from Africa, um, we decided to use uh, genomics and this computational approach to scour the genome for these kind of intergress fragments. So we applied our uh, approach to a data set of sequences we gathered from uh, a bunch of different African populations. We found evidence for several intergressive haplotypes in different parts of Africa, but the frequencies of the intergressive part, uh, haplotypes were highest in the population, the pygmy populations from Central Africa. Using extensive computer simulations, we first showed that the data were not consistent with a model of no admixture at all. So we rejected the null model of no admixture. And using a likelihood approach, we were able to make inferences about the model that involved intergression. In particular, uh, contemporary African populations seem to contain about a 2 percent contribution of genetic material from an archaic form um, that intergressed approximately 35 to 40,000 years ago from a group that split perhaps as long ago as 700,000 years. And the dis given the distribution of these different fragments, we suggested that the interbreeding may have been centered somewhere in Central Africa. Now, I just want to digress for one second here about a very interesting story that came up this year that involved the Y chromosome, and that is the discovery of a very rare and ancient Y chromosome that 
didn't fit into the known picture of Y chromosome diversity. Many, many years of research on the Y chromosome told us it was very much like mitochondrial DNA. All the Y chromosome variation today traced back to a very s recent single ancestor that lived in Africa about 100 to 140,000 years ago. This was, the, this was the picture that we had at the time, and it made a lot of sense because the most divergent lineages on the Y tree were found in hunter-gatherer populations like the Khoisan and the Pygmies, which was very similar to autosomal patterns. Well, this particular lineage which was discovered in a, an African-American man from South Carolina who happened to submit this DNA to uh, the National Geographic Genographic Project, which sees thousands and thousands of samples, was very unusual, did not fit on the tree. And when we, were able, when we dated it, we found that the TMRCA pushed, was pushed back to over 300,000 years ago. And interestingly, when we did extensive database searching to see if we could find where else in the world a chromosome like this might exist, we were fortunate to find in Africa, out of thousands and thousands of chromosomes that we searched through, there were 11 that seemed to be very closely related to this uh, chromosome. And it turns out all 11 come from one little tiny region of Western Cameroon from a farming group called the Embo. Now, I just highlight that because the Embo live very, very close to this site that Christopher was talking about, the Iwo Lero site, where there's intermediate or mosaic uh, forms, uh, half sort of intermediate between archaic and modern, modern uh, groups. Well, so just to update where we stand today, now we have to add another admixture process in, in Africa, along with the two outside of Africa. And I just wanted to end by saying something about what kinds of models are supported by the genetic evidence. Certainly, we can no longer believe that the right replacement model is correct, even after 25 years of dominating as a paradigm, it seems to have fallen. And the new models that seem to be relevant are models that were also proposed many years ago based on fossil data. I will talk, I think that this is probably the most reasonable model. It's a, it's a replacement model with hybridization, but I also, I'll skip over that as there doesn't seem to be a single location for transition in Africa. There's no single Garden of Eden. There's a transitional forms that are spread very vastly across the continent. Therefore, there's certainly the opportunity for gene flow among these morphologically diverged groups over a long period of time. And I really like the idea, Chris already described it, where you have the multi-regional model now restricted to Africa, so at a different geographic scale. But these traits that make us anatomically modern could have been flowing along this trellis network of gene flow among these morphologically diverged groups for quite some time until the anatomical form was assembled in a single package somewhere in Africa. And I really like the idea, um, and I think before we'll really fully be able to address this from a genetic perspective, we need to find the genes that encode these anatomically modern traits and look at their evolutionary histories. So I'll leave it at that.